Jim, when did you go into the army and, and why? Well, I was on the cusp of getting drafted mm -hmm. uh, in 1966. 66. So I so I tried to get uh, I tried to get into the service as a pilot. Uh, 800 of us took a test. 200 people came out of that, took another test. 100 people came out of that, took another test. Then you go into the second day. And that all get got massaged down to right around 30 of us. And then we went and took flight physicals and only seven of us came out of that. Mm -hmm. So you see the grinding that goes on to get you out the other end of the tube. So, so that's, that's how I started. I, I, I had my choice of sitting on my buns and, and winding up being uh, uh, drafted. Uh, or I could go for the gold, which was my dream was to fly. And I had already been a pilot. I was a pilot in high school. I got my pilot license before I got my driver's license, actually. I mean, that's a fact. Um, so, I, so flying is what I wanted to do. It was, it was and this, it, I, when I saw that I could get in there, uh, it was like, I've got to try this. And so um, coming out the other end was, you know, you raise your hand and off you go. Yeah. And so this is 66, by which time things in Vietnam are heating up. If you're going into the army in 66, um, then we know certainly in retrospect, there's a really good chance you're gonna end up going to Vietnam. Were you aware of that at the time? That if I, I mean, you must've been in some vague way, but I mean, was it in at the, front of your mind that if I go into the army in 66 or, and in your case, if Jim goes into the army in 66, then there's a really good chance he's going to end up in Vietnam. Is this something that you were, I, you, you might, I mean, you must have been aware of it in some general sense, but was it something that, you know, you were quite specifically aware of that yeah, was by, by doing this, there's a good chance I'm going to Vietnam. I went into it as it was a foregone conclusion. Yeah, we knew that, but he was doing that. He, he enlisted in the army. Uh, because that gave him a chance to fly, we were getting married. We fell, we met, and we fell in love. And we thought, well, you know, how are we going to jump this hurdle? Hurdle, I guess. You know, you got to have an income of some kind. You can't just fall in love, be married, and expect your parents to support you. I mean, that I means I guess some people do. I don't know, but we don't. So we had to make a plan, and we had to make a plan to be adults. And um, so I stayed and went to school. Um, I had our first baby. I was pregnant when he left for Vietnam. And that was planned. That was a part of him that I had responsibility for that I could, you know, and thank God and everybody that we had a healthy baby because I think it would have killed me if I hadn't, if she hadn't had yeah. my next my next pregnancy was a miscarriage. So I really appreciate that the first one was there. And in fact, just as an aside, um, apparently that the status of, of, of miscarriages went way up. Um, the st st statistics, not status, went way up for, from babies that were conceived after their parents, their dad had been to Vietnam. And it's probably an it's suspected to be an Agent Orange problem. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, but we don't have any proof or don't know anything. Yeah. But back, we, we said, okay, we want to be with each other. We want to be married. We want, how are we going to do this? Were you aware? I mean, is this something that, you know, is, is that you're processing that if, I fly and if I go to Vietnam then I'm I mean there's a really good chance then that I'm going to be in some kind of combat situation um I mean were, were you aware that okay I mean because a related question would be well you know why not try to get a job uh, a specialty that more likely would have you in in the rear echelon was there, in addition to wanting to fly, was there also at that time a desire to be in the mix, so to say? I mean, was that part of the decision to fly? 
I was raised uh, in a military family. Mm. Okay, my father, all of my uh, all of my life was in the military. Um, I sent you a photograph of of my father and I. Mm. Um, the uh, uh, he uh, the, the the stories listening to the stories in World War II with him and his friends. Okay, they were all enlisted guys riding in the back of bombers and such. And, uh, and they had uh, some incredible stories. And one of, his, one of, the, one of the gentlemen, Chuck Oliver, uh, had been shot down and was a prisoner of war for two years in a Nazi prisoner of war camp. And um, he, had, uh, uh, he had his Bible and his Bible had things marked all through it. Um, they were both profound portions of the Bible, and they were also a code where people could send messages to one another using the Bible. And so he, the, 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 the atmosphere that I grew up in was one of, as far as I was concerned, heroes. You know, um, my ambition was to be a pilot in the military. That was my ambition, to be a pilot in the military. Um, so it was... It was not, uh, I mean, the brutality that I, that I wound up in and seeing and everything was totally different than, than, uh, than the, the image that you put in your, in your mind prior to that. Right. But um, I, I had no, um, uh, no problem knowing that, that that's where I was going to go. And I wanted to go. I mean, they were, they were saying, if you don't want to go, to Vietnam and you want to try to get a billet in Germany or whatever, let us know, you know, it was like, well, uh, that was, the, the guys were talking among themselves sort of like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, you know, I just studied, I just studied hard. I, try, I tried to learn everything the way it's supposed to work and how the machines, how the machines work. You know, you, you put this inanimate object together right. uh, piece by piece so that you, when it starts failing on you, you know how far you can go with what you have left. And that's, uh, that's what pilots. Yeah. Let me ask you another question, Jim, and then I want to ask Anna a question. Um, did you ever find yourself, as you're going through training, hoping that you would be among the minority that did go to Germany or that did go to South Korea or Panama, something like that? Or, or did you really actually want, at that time, actually want to go to, to Vietnam? No, I wanted to go to Vietnam. The idea that I would not go to Vietnam was panicking. Let me, let me then ask a follow-up then. In retrospect, let's say we could, some, by some miracle, go back and go back to that point where you're training and now you actually have the choice okay you can go to vietnam or instead you can go to germany in retrospect would you still go to vietnam or would you instead choose germany or south korea or panama something like that no i'd, I'd go yeah i think though in reality he had let his great his gpa slip and so he was going to probably be drafted so yeah, but that's okay. You're, he was a vote, and then you really had no choice yeah, right. of even to fly or not. Yeah, yeah. So he made sure that if there was any chance that he was going to be drafted or have to serve anyway, in spite of it, well, he should do it to so it'll help him. You um, know, when, when you when you're being trained at the level that we were being trained to fly in combat in close combat. Um, it, 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 there's a selfness, selflessness that you have to put on as a coat when you get in a helicopter. Mm. And you have to be aware of that. It's part of your uniform. And like I say, I raised in the military family uh, my grandfather was in uh, in World War One. Um, he has an incredible stack of citations for valor. It was in the blood, so to speak. 
let me let me just follow up on that uh, real quick, and then I then I want to ask Anna a question. You just used that word selflessness, and that that gets to something that um, you know I wonder about when I think about pilots, uh, helicopter pilots in in Vietnam, because you know the human instinct. Um, when you're under immediate threat is to take cover to get out of the way something like that and I, I imagine that doesn't go away but one of the things that really strikes me about helicopter pilots as i have talked to them and as i read their memoirs is um you are there you're operating this complicated machine um under grave threat often under fire but yet you're there and you're steady until those wounded guys get on the helo or until whatever needs to happen happens. And when you say selflessness, that's the first thought that comes to my mind. Uh, something that I think is really, I mean, just kind of amazing an ability to just hang in there with the machine, even as if you can hear bullets hitting, the helicopters are coming in to hang in there until whatever needs to get done is done. Um, is that kind of what you mean by at least an example of yeah, that's, that's the exactly selflessness it. that comes along? Yeah, that's exactly it. And um, the, the people that weren't like this, you didn't fly with. The people that were not like that, you didn't fly with, period. Yeah, it takes a, I, that just takes a certain psychological resolve that I don't, I just don't think most people have, which I imagine is part of this process, um, this very rigorous process that the army puts you through to, you know, put you in the cockpit in the, in the first place. You, you, you know, going in, you know, going in some people, you know, you, you can deny anything you want until all of a sudden you're, uh, you step on the tarmac and in Cameron Bay or, 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 or uh, Da Nang or, or uh, uh, Tonsonut, you step on the ground and you look across and they're loading coffins into the back of a, of a transport to take to America. Um, it, it's an eye opener. It's an eye opener. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, you're, when you, when you realize that you're there, uh, there are there are a couple things that you realize. One is that number one, the the just the air touching your body is different. The the smells going in your nose are different. Uh, the you you're seeing with your eyes are are different. They are what you were expecting to see, but a hundred times more profound. And, and, and that's what all of a sudden, that, that's where you are. And to a certain extent, you're saturated by this, instantly saturated by it. And so you have to figure out a way to, to say, hey, this is still me. I'm here. It's me. I, Are you, you're talking about that. Um, I don't know if adrenaline is the right thing, but you hear combat veterans refer to combat situations where there is an intensity to things where this is this is the entire world i mean this cockpit is all of the world and and this is easily the most important thing that's happening anywhere in the world and just an incredible intensity about that experience is, is that what you're talking about yes that's exactly it and 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 there are um, like I say, the pe the person that's sitting next to you, because these are crews. These aren't. You're not sitting there all by yourself. Mm -hmm. You're you're with other people, and everyone's job is to help one another, primarily to stay alive on your flying machine. But the flying machine has its own its own reason to exist, which is to go and help the rest of these people. So. Yeah. So you you have to you have to know the mindset of the crew that you're getting on the helicopter with. Mm -hmm. You don't know because you don't know what you're going to get into. But you want somebody sitting next to you that has a capacity to singularize down to if I throw that switch, I can help the crew. Not oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You don't. You can't be there with, with 
that kind of thought. And I've been there with that kind of thought. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard place to be. And I wanted to ask you uh, um, about a, a, a 10 minute period um, because there was some, some moment when, you know, Jim goes out of your view for the last time until, you know, he has r, &R in Hawaii. And so you see him there. Um, and of course, you know, we know that, that Jim does come home from the war, um, but you don't, you don't know that, that that's going to be the case. Um, so I'm in, I wonder if you could just sort of walk us through a, a, a 10 minute period that five minutes leading up to that moment when Jim goes out of view for the last time before he had, as he's heading to Vietnam. And then that five minutes after he has left your view. And so now you're on your own. So really the last five minutes of being together and the first five minutes of being on your own. Um, I understand it's decades ago, but to the extent that you, that you can piece that together in your memory, how would you describe that? I, um, we dropped him off. I wasn't alone when we dropped I, his parents um, and I, his sister went to the airport and we dropped him off there. And actually I was looking at his mother because her husband, she had done that with her husband in a sense because Jim's dad had, was in the military. And now she's doing sending her son and and I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. And I'm thinking if we have a boy, I hope he's not going to be going and I'm not going to be sitting in her place for that. Because, you know, you don't know what's going to come of it. Um, when he came back, he was a, a lot of different person. He was still in the same basic inside person. But he was, I guess you know, I don't know how to describe how he was. He, he seemed to be more tr easily triggered by getting angry or getting um, upset by something. Um, and I, 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 though I still have that last seeing him though the one thing that is my post-traumatic stress thing is i have to know where he is and not because i don't trust him for where he's going since he was gone and i couldn't actually touch him or see him i have to know where he is and if he's going somewhere, he tells me he's going to go to the grocery store, to the drugstore. It's not that I think he's going to be getting in trouble and I don't trust him. It's because I need to know where he is or I get all tied up in knots. And I need to know that he's okay. And that's why I need to know where he is, is because I need to know he's okay. And well, just, So how did, how did you deal with that then during this year when it just wasn't possible to know where he was? That was very difficult. That was, it's, that's the way it is. And that's, you, you know, I'd wait for the letters. I'd wait for this phone call. Well, we had like two phone calls. Two phone calls. Um, late, we had made, we, we made tape recordings and I didn't get that. You know, that's why I didn't get it. I didn't know, I did not know when I'm reading this letter, is he still alive? Is he still there? Is he coming home? I don't know. Did you, did you, possible. did you, some, you know, the wives I've talked to, some say that they did not pay attention to the news. Um, that, of course, they wanted the letters and they wanted the recordings from their husbands, but they didn't pay attention to the news. Others say that they followed the news very closely and would, you know, look for news. If, if I know that my husband is stationed near Pleiku or Cameron or Da Nang or something, then I'll pay real close attention to that. Uh, which in which category were you? He well, I stayed with his parents when he was gone, mm -hmm. and his dad and I were both uh, sitting at that TV every night looking. If they showed a Chinook helicopter, 
is that him? Is that him? Was he there? Was he okay? Was he in the middle of this and it was bad? You know, it was, it was really terrible because we never knew at this, that particular time if he was okay. Mm. And, and if the doorbell rang, oh my God, you, is that, are they coming to tell us, you know, I mean, it, it was horrible because you're always expecting and dreading that he's not going to come back or well, he's going to come back, but not, maybe in pieces, you know, and, and, and how can you do that? And that's part of the reason I was pregnant when he left was because I had this baby and this baby was part of him that I had that I, I was responsible for, that I could do stuff for. And she was very, very important. I had this part of him, genetic part of him, I guess you could say, that I could care for, that I could do stuff for. And she was a wonderful baby too anyway, not hardly ever crying, smiling and all that stuff. But um, that's really what how I made it through is I had that responsibility. I could not... And I was going back to school, so I was had promised I would do that. So I had those two responsibilities, but I had that one special. I had to keep her alive. I had to keep her healthy. I had to keep her. And that was pretty much where I yeah had, that I left. If you could just so you you're there in the airport and you say you're looking at Jim's mom, she had done something similar. Um, in the Second World War, I imagine, or the, was it the Second World War? Mm -hmm. Said goodbye um, to her husband as he was going off to war. Now you're doing the same. Um, as, you're, as you replay that tape in your mind, um, can you just describe it for us as I, I, I imagine there's a moment that comes and say, okay, well, this is it. I have to go. Um, and then I, I imagine that then you stand there and watch Jim walk off and then at some point he goes out of view and 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 then what happens right could you just sort of walk us through and tell us about that experience well that that was a day that we we went um Jim's dad drove and um his his mom was in the front seat I was in the back seat his sister who wasn't too happy that um I was there because she kind of blamed me for him going. And I guess she was kind of right. <laughs> but um, she, we went in the airport we, and he, we took him. He was sit, sitting on, uh, next to me. And we went to the airport in Ontario, California, a very small airport. It wasn't a big thing. So we went in and we stood and we could actually watch him walk out to, to get on. And I just felt like part of me was going. But it was weird because his mother, she said, well, then we went, to, Jim's dad went to work. His sister did whatever she did. His mom said, let's go have our hair done. Well, having my hair done wasn't necessarily I something I wanted to do, but I didn't have anything else to offer. And I didn't want to make her feel bad because this is her son that's doing this. And, and she's kind of been through this before with her husband. So we went to this um, beauty shop and the gal working on me would not shut up about how she was having such a hard time with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. She went on and on and on. And I was sitting there just kind of, like a ice cube melting in the chair, you know, I, I couldn't, what do I say to her? You know, I can't, I did not want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. And here I was with this chatterbox trying to tell me, oh, I had a fight with my boyfriend. Oh, well, poor little you, you know, why don't you send him out there? But I didn't say that, you know, so you that was, her. no, I didn't say anything. But I, I didn't say anything. I couldn't say anything. And so when we were, I paid and then my mother-in-law was doing her thing and I, and she said something and I think she's told them because then they, 
said and looked out, they looked my direction and said, oh, we're so sorry or something like that. And I just said, it's okay. And I left. I couldn't, I just couldn't, I was falling apart and I had to get my hair done of all things, you know, it was, it was really awful. It was, one, it was probably the worst day of my life. It was really terrible. But when he, he got on the airplane, it was a regular airplane thing he, he got on. And I was thinking about his mom having to do it and hoping that I wouldn't have to do it with our child. One of the things about the, uh, I, I, I remember that they would say uh, every now and then in the letters about the news that they were seeing and they, you know, what's going on. And um, there is a, there is a, a lack for a better term of news that came out of the central highlands. Mm. And, um, and about the uh, Joe Galloway, and he drank uh, as a newsman. Um, that pretty much epitomizes the life in the Central Highlands for people on the ground. And the helicopters were the ones that serviced those, those folks. And we did not bring newspaper people with us. Um, normally, uh, when we did see uh, uh, someone who wanted to to do a news snippet or something, um, they would be um, they would not be aware uh, of the intensity of war that they were going to that they wanted to go into, and so and so um, by and large we never we wouldn't take them because I didn't. I didn't want to be responsible. There was only one guy, one photojournalist that that I took around every now and then, uh, and I don't even remember his name. Um, uh, he was uh, he wasn't a, he wasn't American. He was like French or something. But I am sorry, I don't remember his name. Um, but he was the only one I would take. I wouldn't take uh, I wouldn't take Americans because they didn't. I didn't want to be responsible for them not knowing what they were getting into. You would tell, hey, look, this is, we're going where it's, oh, I want to go. I got to go. I'm going to take pictures. And I got my cameraman here. It's like, hey, no, no, no. Yeah. You were in two corps, is that right? I was in two corps. Two corps. What, what are some of the, the key places that, you know, you would, you would work in or around? We did, uh, I lived on I lived on the coast south of Tuiwa, and we we were dispatched normally uh, to the highlands, uh, and we worked in support. I was with the 180th. We worked in support with the 179th shrimp boat, um, and and we moved fire bases. That was our job, moving fire bases. And uh, and once the fire base was in position, any heavy item that they needed normally it was some sort of a fuel or the or or, or ammunition uh, we took hot seas every day so did the hueys the hueys flew to all of the little outposts around where the chinook couldn't get into uh, unless we were using long slings and uh and so so the the central highlands uh uh, the, 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 the cities, I can tell you the cities, uh, Pleiku, Kantum, uh, Dok To, Special Forces, Dok Peck, north of there, um, Ben Het, which was right on the border. It's like the T of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Uh, nasty places. And then fire bases all along the frontier. We put these fire bases in our Special Forces resupply. Um, and and there's no, there's no, I mean, I mean it, it's our own fault. I mean, I, I'm part of the fault that there's no visual uh, record of that by the news media. But because uh, whenever we see, whenever we see documentaries, like even Burns' documentary, there's nothing in the Central Highlands. There's nothing. Zero. And uh, the guys way down in the Delta that were having to do, put up with all the people that knew how to burrow around rivers and stuff, there's nothing about them either because it's so dangerous. It was just too dangerous to put these people in. And um, so, 
so the, the you know the the result of it is that when I would take off, I would go to Camp Holloway, which was south of Pleiku. We would refuel, or and then we would get our mission the mission sorties, and then we would go to the logistics pads, pick up our sling loads, and off we'd go, or our internal cargo, and off we would go. Uh, and then we would just do that all day long. We would do it for eight, 10, 12 hours sometimes. Um, in the battles, uh, we had the, the siege at Ducklop, which was a special forces camp that occurred in uh, August of 68. And it was, uh, it was attacked by thousands of people, thousands. Uh, there was a Zapper Brigade, and there was uh, there was a regular regular brigade. I mean, there's all there were all kinds of people there, and um, we flew in support of that. Hueys flew in support of that. Gunships flew in support of that. Jets flew in support of that. The whole structure of the hierarchy of of, of aviation uh, flew in support of that special forces camp, and it lasted for days. Um, when you're the only Chinook that's there, um, uh, well, you're one of the only Chinooks that's there, let me put it that way. Yeah. Um, you're used, you're in use all the time because rather than send 20 Hueys, we'll send one Chinook and it makes perfectly good logistical sense. And we as crews, that's what we signed up for. That's what we did, mm. you know, um, but I went into Ducklop, um, uh over the over the course of the battle to the point where the flight surgeons the flight surgeon came on the aircraft gave us dexedrin that we chased down with a shot of whiskey and a sandwich and and uh, you know he would look at our hands and if we could we could hold on to the controls you're good to go because they did not have anybody else the crews were just worn to the nubbin and the, the dexedrin was to keep you awake keep you awake and it also takes all your memory with it so so the only the memory that i have are pits and pieces where the dexedrin was wearing off i could see that but my crew they're the ones that say mr weather are you aware of what we did that night well tell me about it so that i can try to get it in my head you know wow. and uh but it's but it's uh it's it's not it's, you know, it just gets wiped out. You know, <laughs> I've talked to doctors about it. It's like, yeah. oh, that's, yeah. that's wiped out. So, okay. So, so the, but one thing that happened that I remember was a, a, a Huey crashed in the wire. He got shot down in the wire and killed everybody, but the pilot, they threw him on board us. We took him out. Okay. Uh, let's step aside from everything and fast forward 20 years. I wound up flying with this man. Wow. And he he is he's a loose cannon. Nobody wants to fly with him. Nobody understands him. So if they said, Weatherall, well, you know, you're brand new, you go fly with him. So I went and flew with him and I asked him, what's bothering you? You know, what's going on? I said, You act like you've been in Vietnam. And he looked at me, he said, I was in Vietnam. He said, So was I. I was the man who rescued him, but I didn't, I didn't rescue him. I flew him to the to the hospital, to the emergency pad. So all of a sudden, beautiful bond, beautiful bond. It lasted about ten years, and he hung himself. He couldn't live it. He couldn't live with this, his survival and their loss. This is when you were a civilian pilot. You're both civilian pilots. Yeah. And he he committed suicide, and your interpretation was basically survivor's guilt. Is that survivor's guilt? Yeah. He didn't keep anything. He kept he, he kept just enough to sustain his life, keep his uniforms clean, keep himself healthy. Everything else he gave away. He gave it away. One paycheck went straight to a, an orphanage, and and the other one he lived on, part of. You needed the, you needed something. He just gave you the money. He was he was so generous that it was it was like flying with a saint. But you you know. But there's a what's what's caused this. What what's in there? And once he and I figured out where we connected, we had somehow connected in time and space. God only knows how that all happened, but it did. Yeah. 
you know, and this was right about the same time he died. He died right about the same time that the country did all their big kumbaya circle that we love the veterans, we love the Vietnam veterans. And that it's another, it's like a wedge. It's like a wedge that was just driven in between me and our society. That someone that generous, someone that capable kills himself. It's crazy. You, you um, probably won't know the answer to this, but I'm just wondering what your surmise is. What do you think took a, a bigger toll on him? The, the memories of combat and surviving the Huey being shut down, the others did not survive. Um, obviously that's going to take a toll. Um, and then there's the toll of, as we've discussed, the way that, that the Vietnam veterans were treated when they came home. Which of those two do you think took the greater toll? I think that they, they joined hands. I wanted to ask, you said that um, you, you mentioned in your memoir that you, when you came home, you had 1,341 combat hours of, of flying. And I was going to ask you, you know, um, if you could pick one of those hours of the 1,341, if you could pick one and just tell us what happened in that one hour. And perhaps what you've related, you know, that's the hour that you would would talk about, but um, is there something else that comes to mind of all those, all those hours that you flew, if there's an experience that you experienced, if there's an experience you had in one of those hours um, that maybe gets a, you know, a core experience of your year in Vietnam, is there something that, that comes to mind? Um, we were sent uh, we were sent to a village, uh, mountain yard village on the Cambodian border. Uh, the, uh, the North Vietnamese army was conscripting the men and they would come in camp at night and take them. So the people that were left were women, old, old men that really couldn't become porters or bearers or whatever, young children. But the, the, uh, the word on the, on the street for, the, for that mountain yard village was that it was gonna be, they were gonna come in and just wipe it out. And so the, the special forces camp that was near there said, hey, we gotta get these people out of here. And so, uh, so I went, I got dispatched. Um, and uh, I wound up landing in the middle of this mountain yard village. Uh, there was a, a gunship, uh, two gunships that escorted me in and out of the place. And uh, these people all came on and they came on with their children and they came on with their chickens and their ducks and their piglets. And the, the, and the Chinook turned into, it looked like, a, looked like a village had moved aboard the back of an army helicopter. They mean, we'd be put up the canvas seats. Everybody sat on the floor or on their stuff, just filled it up. And, uh, uh, you, know, you know, every now and then it was like, can we hover? The crew chief was counting people and everything. And, hmm. and uh, we took the whole village in one load. I mean, it was, it was, and it, it when we, and we left and this, this, uh, this guy was in the back, uh, one of their, he was a priest. Uh, he was a mountain yard Vietnamese priest, Buddhist, I believe. And, uh, and he had an incense burner, just a real tiny little one. He was doing that. And uh, so they, so we had this aroma in the, in the aircraft and we had all these, all these chickens chirping and ducks quacking and pigs oinking and all these little kids laughing. They loved it. They loved the flight. They were laughing and cooing and hawing and, uh, so I, I climbed up out of the seat and I went in the companion way and I was just looking at them and they were all so happy. They all, all the adults had, they had happiness on their faces. Wow. Where did you take them? 
we took them to uh, we took them to Fan Piet, which is a military air base and and other other assorted stuff there, and um, and they went and I don't know where they went from there. We wow. we landed we landed at Fan Piet at, over on the you know, go over there with all those people, and there were other there were already other people there. I didn't wow. even know that the people had even. So yeah. these were these are people who needed to be resettled because intelligence said that the North Vietnamese were planning to just level that village, take the village out. Yeah, and that was from the special forces guys that uh, that were you know right down the road. It's like, hey, right. we got to get them out of here, and uh, um, you know that was that, and 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 you know uh, there the the country is a beautiful country. The, there are you know there are there were times when uh, when the beauty you were looking at was destroyed. I remember we were flying, we were flying uh, over by, over by, uh, we, were, we had refueled in Docto and we were going north. Um, and we were, we were on our way uh, to a, uh, to a long range patrol that was had had gotten up on top of a mountain and we were just going to pluck them right off. Yeah. And uh, over the guard radio frequency, you know, they start issuing coordinates, coordinate, da, 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 to coordinate, da, 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 you know, arc light. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, that coordinate is right back there. And the other one is right up there. Mm. And we're right on the border. So we move over just a little bit and they just, Boom, 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 boom. And this beautiful, you know, this, this beautiful landscape of gorgeous trees and everything mm. just goes up in, in smoke. And, and you're there and you have the concussion on the helicopter and everything. It's like, wow, we I don't want to ever want to get any closer than that, you know, but, we, yeah. but you, it, it, it happened. You, we saw it. It was right there. So we go up and we pluck these guys off their hill and, you know, take them back to, to a dock toe and let them they do whatever they do and then we went down to uh to contoon worked down there for a while and then went to holloway i mean it's just that was kind of a day you know so it uh yeah wow. that that relocating that that those children and those people that was i think yeah my favorite number is 87 there were 87 heartbeats on there wow, wow. <laughs> got you got me yeah wow yeah you shared memories of when Jim left. And so, you know, the last minute of him being in the in the States, again, you would meet when he had um, R&R &R in Hawaii. Um, but you described that last minute in the continental US. How about the return? What's your, what's your memory of now seeing Jim for the first time, really the first second uh, back on so uh, back on the soil of the continental U.S. That was, that was until he was actually in each other's arms, very, very stressful because I didn't know if he was going to really, if, if something, you know, it's like being superstitious and you think that something's going to be grabbed out away from you. Something that's important mm -hmm. is going to be suddenly just pulled out from under you maybe the ground even, you know? And so I was waiting at the airport. And uh, of course, then we had a little toddler at the time. Well, no, she wasn't. That She was just eight months. Eight months, yeah. She wasn't really walking yet, but, uh, you know, the baby. And um, we watched the planes unload and we were waiting for the plane. And he had contacted me somehow. We didn't have emails or any of that stuff then. How did you contact me that I you were in you. Seattle? I called you on the phone. What phone? The, at, the, at the house, at dad's house. Oh, okay. Then we went to. Then you went. Okay, that when he, he wanted, they wanted to know right. what time I was going to be there. And I didn't know because I didn't have a ticket to LA yet. That's right. So <laughs> we were in Riverside yeah. and he called and said, okay, I'm in the States. And that's great. But <laughs> is fate going to suddenly rip that out? You know, of all that we've been through, it, it's like being superstitious. Mm. It, it makes you superstitious. 
all these little things you don't know how to read it. Is that a sign for something? Is it just ordinary things? So the we're at the airport and the and the crowds were coming off the plane. It must have been a pretty big plane because um, I kept looking and looking and I saw somebody that had a I think a hat or something and um, and it wasn't him. It was somebody else. Like there, his family was standing over on the side. And he, he must have been sitting in the last seat in the plane, I'll tell you. That's was, way in the back. Everybody <laughs> that got off, it just, you know, my heart goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Finally, he showed up and it was just, he felt so good to be hugging him. It just felt so good. Mm. And he could see his little girl and that was perfect. So he saw her when she was about how old was she then eight, eight months old yeah. yeah eight months old not knowing who you are anymore when he was gone you know I was a wife but I didn't have a husband at that time I, I mean he was there um I had a baby growing and then a baby and then I thought oh my gosh got a, a baby and you know i imagine over a year's time someone's going to say oh you know what is what does the baby's dad do or where's your husband or something like that where when you were asked that were you reluctant to say my husband's in vietnam well when i was pregnant most of the time i was pregnant he was in vietnam um part of the time after i had her i was still in school i was finishing up my college degree um, but I was going to school. Um, I didn't really, uh, if somebody asked how he was in Vietnam, but it wasn't anybody, you know, it was something that you didn't really talk about because we were told, we being the, the wives before our husbands, on the, I guess you'd say the, the um, little bit of information they gave us was don't tell people your husband's gone. Don't tell your people you're alone. Don't tell people that he's in Vietnam because people were coming, were faking, making a phone call and pretending to be in the military and telling people that their son, husband, whatever, had been killed. Mm -hmm. that, that phone call, or they come, will come to the door and ring the doorbell. Um, so we were told not to tell anybody that our husbands were in Vietnam, that we were alone, that we had, you know, we just, we just did our, and I didn't really have time to be social anyway, because I was taking a full load and pregnant and then taking a full load. In fact, I went into labor in class. So, um, right. that's a story. So, so with all of that, it was just a whole lot of being torn, a whole lot of different directions that I really didn't know who I was or where I was. I was just trying to make it through till he could get home. People that go to battle normally are informative, they're in their formative years. And, and so, the, so it, it's changing them. The, their, their entire view of the world is changing. Sure. Um, the, 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 the consequence of these world changing things that happen to you is that when you get out of the service, I think that, uh, I think that <laughs> actually that Sylvester Stallone, Stallone said it best uh, years and years and years ago. He's sitting in the sheriff's office. He just riddled the place full of holes, shot the sheriff, Oh, this is Rambo. The colonel goes in to get him and he says, I used to be somebody. Mm. I used to be somebody. Well, well, we were we were somebody. I flew a two million dollar aircraft. I carried people around with me. I was responsible for their lives. I was responsible for keeping people alive by giving them stuff. You get back to America. Hey, fella, it takes 25 cents for a cup of coffee or get the hell out. Mm. That's a big change. That's a big change.